Our next chapter, number 23, is entitled Environment in the Developing World. The first question the book raises is, as I write here on the first line, state control versus private control. Are there advantages to having government regulation of the economy in the extreme that would be in a, uh, examples would be like in the Soviet Union and in uh, communist uh, communist China in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And the answer is, as I write, that there don't seem to be much different environmentally. Certainly there were environmental disasters in both the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China in its early decades. In the Soviet Union, uh, you're probably familiar with the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, a, a meltdown of the core of a nuclear power plant caused by a poorly designed plant. But there were many other examples of air pollution, water pollution, major lakes drying up. In China, there was a famous example during the Great Leap Forward of the early 1960s. Chairman Mao thought that since sparrows were eating grain that was being grown as crops, that we should try to kill all the sparrows. And so there was a massive popular campaign to kill as many sparrows as possible. When you had a decrease in the number of sparrows, you had a large increase in the number of insects because the sparrows were also eating the insects. The insects caused the increase in incre insects caused way more crop damage than the sparrows ever did. So it was realized that that was a bad thing, but just an example of the sort of attitude towards the environment which the communist governments had. So certainly capitalist economies do bad things uh, with the environment, but um, the countries under the control of communist parties did bad things to the environment as well. And, and the reason why that's mentioned in this chapter is because it was in the developing world, or the so-called third world, where lots of the debates about should we go to capitalism or should we go to communism were, were being held, uh, where those topics were being debated. The next thing I want to discuss here is the Kuznets curve, box 23.2. There are several different versions of the Kuznets curve, as we'll see, but they all consist of graphing some sort of pollution problem on the vertical axis and per capita income on the horizontal axis. And the question is, as per capita income goes up, what happens to pollution? Does it go up? Does it go down? Or does it do neither? So what is the relationship between per capita income between how rich or poor our country is and pollution. And the book does a, actually an excellent job of discussing the different possibilities, m much better than, than most textbooks. The first thing they point out here is that there are some kind of problems, like the ones I've labeled capital A, which are the population without safe drinking water, and the urban population without sanitation, where the Kuznets lo curve looks as follows. So population without safe drinking water, if you have really low per capita income, you might have a pretty bad pollution problem here. You might have, in fact, you do have uh, lots of people without access to safe drinking water. But as per capita income increases, more and more people get access to safe drinking water. And in countries like the US, very, very few people uh, have any problem getting access to safe drinking water. And so the relationship here is downward sloping. That as per capita income increases, the pollution problem gets better. So that's case A. The next case is case B. And the examples that your book gives for case B are that the pollution problem is urban concentrations of particulate matter like PM2.5 or PM10, that is air pollution, and urban concentrations of sulfur dioxide, it's SO2, like what we discussed in the acid rain chapter. And for case B, the relationship is different. So per capita income,
and the pollution problem. In this case, you get a sort of inverse U shape. So this is case B. So if you have a very poor country, the economy is so underdeveloped that it can't generate a whole lot of particulate matter. And it can't generate a whole lot of sulfur dioxide. It's not burning a lot of coal. The economy is too underdeveloped, too primitive for that. So when you have low levels of per capita income, you have low levels of the pollution. But when you have high levels of per capita income, you also have low levels of these kinds of pollutions because the public and the government are very aware of these pollution problems and they take steps to fix it. It's the middle income countries where you have a high level of these pollutants. These countries are developed enough to be able to generate a lot of a lot of particulate matter or a lot of sulfur dioxide pollution but they're not rich enough to be very interested in cleaning them up. Now type B is the classic example of a Kuznets curve shape. So when most people talk about the Kuznets curve or the actually environmental Kuznets curve, let me change that in the notes. So what I have changed in the notes is to add the word environmental Kuznets curve because there's another thing that economists talk about that's just called the Kuznets curve. But we're talking about the environmental Kuznets curve here. And the a classic, typical, sort of canonical example of an environmental Kuznets curve here is, is this shape, the, the shape that I've called capital B. Now, your book points out there's also the A shape, and your book points out there's also this C shape. And as examples, they give municipal wastes per capita, and carbon dioxide emissions per capita. And the C shape per capita income versus po the pollution problem. Pollution problem is this shape. So C is an upward sloping shape. In other words, consider municipal waste per capita. When you have when you have a low level of income, people aren't generating a lot of garbage. Middle in, middle levels of income generate a medium amount of garbage and high levels of income generate really high amounts of garbage. So here you have a monotonically increasing Kuznets curve. The same thing we observe for carbon dioxide emissions per capita at at low levels of income, you ha you have, you're not producing a lot of greenhouse gases. At medium levels of income, you're producing medium amounts. And at high levels of per capita income, you're producing high amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. So in case number C, for, a, for pollution problems like case number C, the environmental Kuznets curve is upward sloping. So while most books just talk about shape B, this shape, the inverse U-shape, it's, uh, it's very good that your textbook talks about these other possible shapes, A and C. Uh, next question about the environmental Kuznets curve, is per capita income really the best measure for the horizontal axis? Um, per capita income has disadvantages when it comes to measuring welfare. And people in the last Oh, 30 years have been trying to work on alternatives to per capita income. One of those alternatives discussed in box 23.1 is the Human Development Index. The Human Development Index is uh, is calculated by statisticians working for the United Nations, and it includes things like literacy rate, life expectancy, infant mortality. So it's not just per capita income. Another alternative is called the Genuine Progress Indicator. Uh, one of the economists that have been working on the Genuine Progress Indicator is my colleague, Gunsali Barrick, uh, who teaches here in the Economics Department at the University of Utah. She has calculated the Genuine Progress Indicator for Utah as of, I'm not sure the date, but perhaps it was 
2015 I'm not really sure the date and she's thinking about updating that so the genuine progress indicator just like the human development index is another alternative to GNP or net national product or per capita income as an indicator of human welfare Next topic here, box 23.4 on page 313, the economic cost of environmental degradation. And your book describes these economic costs as percent of GNP circa 1988. So the, the, the point is that environmental degradation has large economic costs. Environmental uh, de degradation is not a a minor almost trivial part of an economy it can be very large and in particular since this chapter is about the developing world your book presents estimates about how large it can it is in some developing countries or it was in some developing countries as examples here in Burkina Faso the book says that the economic cost of environmental degradation is 9% of GNP. In Costa Rica, it's 8%. And in, Ni and in Nigeria, it's 17%. And you should look at the, the rest of the box to see what, uh, what the book says, what the other numbers are like. Nigeria's number is actually the highest. What kinds of environmental degradation are, is the book talking about? Well, in Burkina Faso, the, t the table, the box, 23.4, has a column that this is entitled Environmental Damage and says crop, livestock, and fuel wood losses due to land degradation. So if you have um, it, uh, land de degradation, so let's say you're not investing in the soil, you're letting the soil get depleted, then of course that has consequences for decreased crop yields, uh, decreased amount of forage for livestock, and uh, decreased um, tree growth and therefore uh, fuel wood loss. For Costa Rica, the box says coastal fisheries destruction, deforestation, and soil erosion. For Nigeria, it says soil degradation, deforestation, water pollution, and other erosion. And the book also discusses Ethiopia, Indonesia, Madagascar, um, Malawi, Mala, uh, Mali, um, the Philippines. So it's interesting to see that some of these percent of GDP numbers are not small numbers. Why do you have these kind of large environmental problems in developing countries? Well, one cause is insecure tenancy, so insecure property rights. Often this is because of institutional weakness, by which I mean government weakness. The government can pass laws, but it may not be able to enforce laws. For example, if, if you see a satellite photograph of the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean, Hispaniola is divided between two countries. To the west is Haiti, and to the east is the Dominican Republic. And both of these countries have environmental protection laws. But you can actually see on a satellite photograph where the international border is, because on the Haitian side of the border, there are very few trees. Most of the trees have been cut down. And on the Dominican side of the border, there are forests. Most of the trees have not been cut down. And the reason is not actually because the laws in Haiti and in the Dominican Republic are very different. The main difference is that the Haitian government is characterized by a great amount of institutional weakness. What law is sitting on some law book and some law library in the capital has very little to do with what actually happens on the ground hundreds and hundreds of miles away in the middle of the island, which is far away from any sort of police force. Whereas the Dominican government, um, now the, the, the forests in the middle part of the island are just as remote uh, as far as the Dominican government is concerned, but it has the power to be able to send uh, police officers or army or some, there's some sort of government presence there that means that the law can actually be enforced. And if you try to illegally cut down trees in the Dominican Republic, you're going to get caught. Whereas in Haiti, you usually won't. And so institutional weakness is a common characteristic of governments in developing countries, and it means that environmental protection laws often can't be enforced. 
What you get then is a situation resembling open access, particularly for forests and for fisheries. For forests, this means that people cut down trees when they shouldn't, and for fisheries, you know, we study fisheries quite a bit, um, it means over-exploitation of the fisheries. W the book points out in a rather interesting note that both the poor and the rich are responsible in different kinds of ways for these environmental problems in developing countries. The book describes demographic pressure by the poor and political pressure by the rich. So demographic pressure by the poor means that often birth rates among the poor are very high and increasing number of humans generally leads to more pressure on the environment. Political pressure by the rich uh, means that these uh, governments, maybe all governments, are sensitive to the political desires and economic desires of rich people and when they desire to do things like cut down the rainforest in order to turn the land into something that creates more profit, uh, the governments tend to listen. So you have this combination of demographic pressure by the poor and political pressure by the rich putting pressure on the environment in developing countries. So in the next video we'll, we'll take up the next point here, the environmental impact of economic policies and, and that they can be ambiguous.